Hello, everyone. So I'm Mackenzie, and I'm a Jungian analyst in training. And one of my absolute favorite occupational hazards about this vocation is that people tell me their dreams. And they'll often tell me their dreams with some sort of self-deprecating comment to lead up to it about how meaningless it is or how crazy it is, because we've grown up in this world that wants to explain or explain away anything that we cannot understand rationally. But the thing about dreams is they actually make a ton of sense. They're anything but crazy. Indeed, Carl Jung, oops, let's see, how do I move? Yeah, there we go. So Carl Jung taught that um, dreams represent an accurate snapshot of a person's inner world, of their psyche at the time of the dream. Um, they're admittedly ambiguous. They very rarely contain what they say on the tin, but um, this is on purpose. You know, they employ this symbolic language, the language of metaphors, of emotional experience, of double entendres, of puns. Um, and they do this to kind of veil the truth. And this is why I refer to people sharing their dreams with me as an occupational hazard, because people often don't realize just how much truth they're telling me when they share their dreams. But maybe this is, like I said, on purpose, because the truth must dazzle gradually or else every man be blind, as Emily Dickinson says. Now, over the summer, I had one of these experiences. A new friend, somebody that I was meeting for the first time, um, shared with me a dream. And I didn't know very much about him. All I knew was that he was a psychiatrist and a psychonaut. And he shared with me a dream, really beautiful dream, one that took place in the Frauenkirche in Dresden. In this dream, he entered the church and there were women dressed in white ceremonial garb, singing ceremonial dirges, these, these beautiful chants. Um, he was overwhelmed by feelings of sacredness, of specialness. The atmosphere was supercharged, vaulted ceilings, bright light, music. And in his own words, the experience of this caused the dam to burst. The water gate flooded open and he cried a lot. Later in the dream, he recounted this experience, this overwhelming catharsis to a woman named Yoga. And then again, later in the dream to his mother. Now, when I first heard this dream, without asking him a single question, I turned to him and I said, did you recently take psychedelics with any important women in your life? He just sort of looked at me stunned and said, yeah, I did MDMA with my mom and my sister this past weekend. How did you know that? Now, if I'm honest, I don't really know how I knew. The dream just told me as it goes, which is kind of an unsexy answer. An even unsexier answer is that I knew because I've spent a long time in the phenomenological experience of dreams. I've, I've, learn to contend with the irrationality of symbols and to be in the experience that is to fully grok what it means to be communicated to by a symbol. Because symbols are meant to be experienced, not perceived conceptually. They're irrational. Perhaps sexier answer than slogging through one's own symbolic content uh, is what I'm gonna be talking about for the remainder of this talk. And it requires me to ask you a question. Question is this, what do initiation, logic and immortality have in common? And no, that is not the setup for an epic joke. Although please write me a punchline if you can think of one. But the answer is this, the underworld. Initiation, logic, and immortality can all be traced back to edifying experiences in the underworld. And it's the language of the underworld uh, that my friend's dream spoke to me. Uh, it's, and it's why I can't say a rational reason for how I understood it because, because the language isn't rational. It's not of this world, it's of the underworld. It's, and, you know, it, as a Jungian and, and, and maybe as a, as a psychonaut, I really believe that it's this language of the underworld that, that 
grants us our human wholeness and we fail to learn it at our own peril, honestly. Now, when we speak of initiation, the first of these, of these three things, um, we're often talking about initiation into adulthood. This follows a um, typical kind of trope or, or movement that includes a separation, a transition, and a return. The separation is considered to be the separation from the life of childhood, from, from the paradise of one's homey, familiar territory. Transitional period includes a, what's called a liminal phase, which is a, a phase of being kind of both and between two worlds. And this often includes a kind of spiritual education. The spiritual education connects the initiate to something inside of themselves that feels authentic to them. Um, so that when they return to their society, they can bring something of their own wholeness, their own uniqueness, their own totality. Uh, this, this is how they participate as a mature adult in their society. Initiation can also be considered from the perspective of shamanism. The shaman goes through the same process of separation, transition, and return. However, the shaman is not initiated on purpose. They're initiated through trauma. They're initiated through some big wound. And it is the process of healing this wound that um, through which they discover their gifts, their gifts as a healer. This is why shamans are referred to as the wounded healer. This is also why the symbol of the death and rebirth cycle is often used when referring to shaman, because there's a death that happens in their wounding, and it's the process of learning to heal themselves through which they're rebirthed or reborn. So this process is not a very typical healing process. It doesn't involve antibiotics or visit to doctors. It's, it's really about becoming whole from the inside out. It's about contending with one's own psychic fragmentation, the fragmentation that led to the wound in the first place, and in contending with it, repairing it or growing through it. Carl Jung says that all of the greatest and most important problems of our lives are fundamentally insoluble. They cannot be solved, only outgrown, and it's this outgrowing, which proves on further investigation, he says, to be a new level of consciousness. Maybe it's this process of outgrowing that the shamans undergo when they obtain a new degree of psychic wholeness in their rebirthing process. Now, my own initiation to become a Jungian analyst had me contending with exactly this sort of tension. Um, I had to go through my own outgrowing it was about a year into my studies and my own analysis that I, you know, I was, I was the same person. I was the same woman. I had the same wounds, but I was really relating to my story in a completely different way. I had new resources and that led me to this realization that analysis is just a really, really, really slow acid trip. In my own experience of analysis, I was becoming just as porous and permeable and inside out as when I've taken entheogens. Uh, my waking life and my dream life were blurring. My orientation between inner and outer was like totally toppled. Uh, cause and effect were really suspect. Subject object distinctions were getting fuzzy. I mean, in effect, I was, I was tripping just really slowly. And it was the slowness of this experience that allowed me to stay stable, grounded and integrated despite the obvious madness. I felt indeed like I was gaining new consciousness through contending with my unconscious. And that's when it occurred to me that maybe this is the same thing. Maybe when we dream and when we trip, we're visiting the same place. Now I've come to realize that that place is the underworld. So to be initiated is to be initiated into the underworld. Turns out that logic and immortality also share something in common with the underworld. What we've come to know of as logic in the West, that is Plato's logic, the logic of rationality, is actually a gross misinterpretation of what logic was meant to be. Plato learned logic from Parmenides, but Plato taught logic 
differently than Parmenides. The logic that Plato taught was a, a means of using reason and rationality to solve the paradox. Um, it was concrete, it was heady, it was disembodied. It was all about concepts and ideas. But in its original form, that is in Parmenides' form of logic, it was actually meant to be a language of the irrational, not the rational. It was, it was, it was meant to teach us how to be with the mystery, not solve it, to contend with the paradox and be annihilated by the conundrum of it. Parmenides describes his experience actually of, of obtaining logic as an initiation. He talks about being carried along the path of the sun down into the world of the dead where he met with Persephone, who's the goddess of the underworld in the darkness, which is, he says, the root of all existence. And it was in this place, this underworld place that he was gifted logic. Logic meaning the language or the experience of the underworld. Parmenides goes on to say that logic was a gift to plunge us into the depths of ourselves and strip us of our thoughts so that it can train us to become conscious of the sacred reality at the heart of everything, ever present totally aware of itself without the slightest shading or distance, the living power behind the whole of existence. Now that's a very different logic than the logic that we've come to understand in the West. And ironically, the logic of the West is doing the exact opposite of what it was supposed to do. It's become a means of explaining away the mystery by figuring out the paradox but it was only ever meant to be a way to annihilate the rational mind instead of sharpening it useless. But what does that mean to annihilate the rational mind? The recent bestseller, The Immortality Key by author Brian Murray Rescue might offer some insight. This book outlines what's known as the pagan continuity hypothesis with a psychedelic plot twist. Say that five times fast originally authored or originally proposed by um, authors Carl Ruck, or in their book, The Road to Eleusis by Carl Ruck, who's a classics professor, ethnomycologist Gordon Wasson, and everyone's favorite daddy, the father of LSD, Albert Hoffman. So the hypothesis essentially is this. The ancient Greek mystery schools, such as were practiced at Eleusis, um, employed the use of a psychedelic beverage wine spiked with ergot, ergot being a natural alkaloid of LSD. And it was through drinking this psychedelic brew that initiates would obtain gnosis. That is a living direct experience of the divine, the divine within and the divine without. Subject object ends blurring uh, and a totality being reached. The theory goes on to say that Christ was probably one of these initiates and that he was probably employing the same psychedelic beverage to get his followers to convert them. So this is how paganism became Christianity and how psychedelics were involved. However, unfortunately, at the time of writing their book, The Road to Eleusis, the culture wasn't exactly ready for this kind of blasphemy and the book faded into obscurity. So now, 40 years later, it's Murrah Rescue to the rescue. He's here to save the pagan continuity hypothesis with psychedelic plot twist from its pronouncement of dead on arrival. And basically, spoiler alert, his book says the theory is correct the ancient Greeks were actually taking psychedelic brews to obtain gnosis of God. Christ was one of these and Christ was using psychedelics too. But what exactly is gnosis and what does it have to do with immortality? In modern speak, we might say that the ancient Greeks were having psychedelically occasioned mystical experiences. Recent research in the psychedelic Renaissance has shown that it is these psychedelically occasioned mystical experiences which 
have an extreme healing effect on such things like addiction, end of life, fear, PTSD. And even though we don't quite understand the mechanism of this healing, we do know that it heals. That is having a mystical experience allows one to perhaps outgrow their problems. Um, maybe we should view it like the ancient Greeks viewed it. It's a visitation to the underworld. That is uh, an experience of death and rebirth, which one during which time one becomes immortal, dies while still living, that has this healing effect. Now in, in, in the Immortality Key and Murr Rescue's translation of one of these Greek texts, he talks that he says that the singular purpose, according to the ancient Greeks, of ingesting this psychedelic ritual potion um, was to transcend ordinary space and time to reach a state of consciousness where the ancestors are still living and breathing. Gods and goddesses are made real. He goes on to say that for lack of vocabulary, scholars often refer to this place as the underworld. Now, to recap, what I'm saying is that the underworld is the same place that the ancient Greeks were traveling to, that we travel to every night while we dream, that we're still traveling to in our psychedelic experiences, particularly in these mystically, mystical psychedelic experiences. And that this place is also the unconscious as Carl Jung talks about it. Jung writes about the process of confronting the unconscious that is contending with the psychic split between rational and irrational. He says that the aim of the confrontation with the unconscious is to abolish the dissociation, meaning to abolish the dissociation between, well, rational and irrational. And this isn't to say that the fragmentation is the enemy. Uh, in fact, don't, I don't wanna perpetuate that because believing that fragmentation is wrong obviously just continues the fragmentation. This fragmentation is just a function of growing up in our hyper-rational society. There's, there's nothing we can do about it besides confront this inner figure. Jung talks about it being a confrontation with an inner other. Uh, and it's the experience of this inner other. It's the experience of the unconscious, the mind unfettered by rationality through which one heals, perhaps. And this is a phenomenological experience. It's not one that can be pointed to out there, but one that needs to happen in here. There's no mechanism of healing. As we've come to discover with the psychedelically occasioned mystical experiences, there's no mechanism besides the experience itself. It's, it's an experience of the present moment, um, an experience of, of dreams, of symbols of metaphors um, and the emotional experience involved with them that forces one into a recognition of their own ever-present reality. So at this point, I, I think that I've maybe painted a rather dark picture of the underworld, um, which I did kind of intentionally because, you know, death, immortality, rebirth, uh, but I, I want to stress or point out that the, that the irrational also contains pretty much all of the beauty of human experience as well, including beauty itself, that, that love, beauty, play, spontaneity, music, creativity, art, desire, impulse, these are all gifts of the irrational. They're all gifts from the chthonic unconscious and just like symbols or dreams or psychedelic gnosis, they're an experience that's meant to be had in the present moment. In fact, can only be had in the present moment. They're not ideas to ponder. As Murescu summarizes in his book, ingesting these psychedelic, any kind of religion, it was never about the life after death. It was always, about venturing into the timelessness of the infinite present to realize your own divinity. Which brings me to my final remarks. 
about the subject of dreaming and psychedelics, including the underworld. And I'm going to attempt to put this in a language that we can all tolerate, <laughs> the language of rational science. So let's have a look at what we do know about the dreaming brain and what it might have in common with psychedelic experience. The first is that both contain visuals. Dream images, obviously, we're all familiar with, and the hallucinations of psychedelics. Um, EEG scans also show that um, the brain, while dreaming, while in REM sleep, there's uh, activation of regions of the brain that are known to have something to do with emotional experience and emotionally laden memories. This is also true of the brain on psychedelics. EEG scans also show that there are decreases in phasic activity um, in the parts of the brain associated with rational thinking and increases in the kind of fluid, associative, metaphorical thinking regions of the brain. Sounds a lot like the rational, irrational paradox that we've been talking about. The final similarity between dreaming and psychedelics is that there's a subjective experience or a phenomenological experience of um, a sort of loss of self or the, the boundaries of identity being porous, if, if not non-existent. Um, and psychedelic experiences that can even go as far as to a sort of transcendence of identity or transcendence of self-limitation known as non-duality. So this means that when we dream, when we take psychedelics, our brains are actively employing images. Um, these images are personally meaningful to us. We're emoting or remembering times in our life when emotion, when something very emotionally important happened, that is something poignant, meaningful to our story. We're thinking more freely and creatively. We're making associations that we wouldn't otherwise. Um, and we're transcending a limited self of sense of self. And this allows us to actually experience something, not just conceive of it. That is to have a non-rational closeness with it, not a delimited rational idea of it. It's because of this combination of meaningful images, emotional experience, decreased rationality, and an expanded sense of self that, that maybe this is why Jung talks about outgrowing our problems instead of solving them. It's through this experience of expansion, of meaningful expansion, that we're able to not just grow past our problems, but actually include them in who we are. Said another way, we could talk about the psychedelic state of the brain as being um, a state of elevated entropy. That is a state of increased chaos and disorder. This involves a, a, a loosening of the rationality of normal waking consciousness. Um, and it's been suggested, although further studies are absolutely needed, that uh, this entropic state of the brain at, on psychedelics is similar to the state that we are in when we're dreaming during REM sleep. And it's my assertion that it is exactly this entropic state which leads one to the subjective experience of the underworld. So perhaps it's this language of entropy, the language of the underworld, um, which is the language of Parmenides' logic, which is the language of Jung's collective unconscious. Perhaps it's in this language that we must educate ourselves since we're now in the, psych the psychedelic renaissance. Now, many months ago, I was deep in my own process of contending with the underworld, and I came across a passage in Stanislav Grof's book, LSD Psychotherapy. He details his findings in this book of sitting with thousands of people um, in LSD psychotherapy sessions. And he writes that the dynamic unfolding of various governing systems in the unconscious continues in a more or less subtle way for a long time after the actual pharmacological effects of the drug have subsided. He goes on to say that a very convincing illustration of this process is found in dreams. He furthers it by saying that the content of dreams seems to form a continuum with the content of the psychedelic sessions. It's quite common, he writes, that pre-session dreams anticipate the content of the LSD experience and that post-session dreams 
uh, our attempts to contemplate or to complete, sorry, the gestalts that remain unfinished and to elaborate on the material involved. In other words, the dream moves more of the story along, whatever the story was that was initiated or catalyzed by the psychedelic experience. Because to visit the underworld is the same as dreaming, is the same as psychedelic experience, and all of this is to confront one's unconscious. And perhaps this is what I was picking up on when I was able to determine the meaning of my friend's dream without really any rational information about it. His entropic dream or entropic brain state in his dream was speaking to my entropic brain and all of these symbols were forming a gestalt that pointed to some catalyzing event that had happened recently that, that required all of these symbols to be kind of in the same room at the same time, that is in the same dream. So this is kind of a cool party trick, being able to come to accurate conclusions about somebody's inner world or about somebody's external world based on their inner world. But I, I think that this is more important than the neatness of this sort of rhyme. I think that collectively we're being initiated. We're being initiated as scientists, as psychonauts, as wounded healers um, to embrace our unconscious selves to, to contend with the inner other um, and like slough off the, the forced hyper-rationality that, that is our society. In a paper entitled To Sleep Perchance to Trip, presented in, two, in uh, 2019's Breaking Convention in London, um, the, authors, the authors say that it's the ability the ability to induce dreamlike states of psychedelics, which has this great importance. It has great importance, both in terms of the therapeutic potential of dreaming and psychedelics, and in terms of the wider social implications. And honestly, I couldn't agree more because our rationality has taken us so far and we've been able to achieve amazing things. But now I believe it's time to go into the dark where the night has eyes to recognize its own, as poet David White puts it. And I believe that, like I said in the beginning, we ignore the invitation to learn this language and to contend with our unconscious, to confront the underworld or befriend the other, the inner other inside of us. Well, we ignore that invitation at our own peril. Thank you. From the depths of my underworld to yours for participating, communing with me in this way. It's great to be here with you. There's some references for reference sake. <laughs>